many of you have seen the musical Fiddler on the Roof? Fiddler won the 1965 Tony for Best Musical, which is coincidental. I was born on, in 1965 on this very day. So, to life. <laughs> See, 54 years isn't that long, really. So I've been thinking about life and to life, and there's a wonderful scene in the movie where, uh, and the show, rather, where Laser Wolf announces that uh, Tevye has agreed to allow his daughter Zaitel to marry him. And there's a scene in a, in a bar area, and, and they're singing the song, To Life, To Life, and they're dancing and drinking and having a good time celebrating To Life. And, and what they're celebrating is the... Uh, the or so he thought, the establishment of a new relationship between Zeidel and Laser Wolf. Unfortunately, it didn't quite turn out that way, but in the scene anyway, it was a good time. Everybody was having a good time and dancing and all that. So when we look at the energy of the second chakra, part of what we're, a significant part about that is how do we as independent people relate to other independent people? How are we forming in relationship? Because recall that when we look at the root chakra, the first chakra, we're looking at our family, our origin, where we come from, what makes for solidity in our life. But then as the energy rises, the kundalini uncoils and moves up, then we discover ourselves as separate and distinct from where we came from. And then we start reconnecting in, a, in the world in a different way. So what better way to do so than the symbol of a wedding to life? So, amen to life. So this is uh, week two of our seven-week series on, on 12 Powers, Foundational Teaching in the Unity Movement. Uh, our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, intuited that in the body there were 12 different energy centers, and that's juxtaposed against the seven chakras of kundalini yoga, in which it is inter interpreted that, broadly speaking, there are seven energy centers in the body. And so we are comparing and contrasting those. And in the one is Eastern and one is Western, you might be inclined to think, well, we're comparing apples and oranges. No, we're comparing red apples to green apples. Because what both systems provide is a way of looking at the body energetically, looking at the frameworks for consciousness, looking at a pathway for evolution of spirit, and, uh, and yet from different cultures. But it highlights the fact that these sort of studies about energy centers are cross-cultural. Uh, another example is acupuncture is another one. The Hopis had five etheric energy centers. But this, for this series, we are looking at this, these two particular frameworks in the light of analytical psychology. Now, we shared a little bit about this last week, and I wanted to revisit it for just a moment with a quote from... Unity Magazine, I kid you not, I'm really doing it right, it's turned on there. I did it! Uh, so back in the day, for many years, in Unity Magazine, one of our publications for our movement, there was a, 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 a description of what Unity was, and this is what it said. Unity is a handbook of Christian healing and Christian psychology. The purpose of Unity is not to found a new sect, but to give people practical application of what they already have through their church affiliations. So the founders of Unity weren't necessarily looking to start churches or, or, or centers. They were teachers, is really what they wanted to be. They started in publishing, actually, and then they eventually formed Unity School of Christianity, thinking that what they had learned would help people live healthy, vibrant lives, mentally, spiritually, physically, through a context of understanding spirit, and what they also knew at the same time, since unity's roots are the same of psychology, that there was a connection between mind and body. We call it today mind-body connection. The quote goes on to say, and it's not on the screen, unity therefore stands independent as an exponent of practical Christianity, teaching the practical application of the doctrine of Jesus Christ in all the affairs of life explaining the action of the mind and how it is the connecting link between God and mind, man, how mind action affects the body, producing harmony or discord, sickness or health, and how it brings man into an understanding of divine law, harmony, and peace here and now. So when the ancients began teaching about the chakra system uh, over 3,000 years ago in India, the point was pretty much the same. How to have a healthy, balanced, full life right here and right now. 
So naturally, both systems include how do we think, how do we understand our feelings, how do we relate to our physicality. So that's the whole point of our movement, or as Jesus said in John 10.10, and this is one of my foundational beliefs, that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Or we might interpret that, say we awaken and understand the truth of who we are, our divine inheritance, our inherent divinity, so that we can all have life and have it abundantly. Everybody without fail and without exception. So our focus, very much in new thought, is on this life, the present life, not so much on the afterlife. There are many faith communities that have very clearly articulated the understanding that we do what we do so that you won't go to heaven, or so, that, well, so you will go to heaven and not that other place. You know the one. But, why, but the highlights of fundamental focus and the reason why religion came to exist across humanity anyway. Because as self-conscious beings, there's something we know about ourselves. We know we are all going to die at some point. And knowing this is a source of tremendous anxiety for a lot of folks. So what religion does, and one of, one of the many things that religion does, it gives us a context or a belief about what happens when that experience occurs so that we might stay present in this life. So we might be able to stay centered, knowing that whatever the great unknown is, we at least have some way of understanding what's going to happen there or what's going to transpire. We in unity have this uh, teaching as well, and it's the same one we use in the present tense. The nature of God is altogether good all the time. So whether we have a physical body or don't, nothing changes. Our foundational teaching is we are always connected with divinity from the word go, whether our bodies are purely energy or energy and physicality at the same time. So we don't really have to worry about that so much. So our calling is that as we grow and endeavor to be healthy and whole in every conceivable possible way, that we are also treating everybody with kindness and justice and fairness and love, setting up some consequences of what comes next. So that's, what we, 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 that's our answer to all that, because I don't know anybody who hasn't been through hell. Is anybody here, or is it just me? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, and what we tell people in Unity and New Thought, don't stay there. You don't go there and make a tent. And I don't know anybody who hasn't had some sort of heavenly experience where everything's great or peaceful, or, or who among us has ever tasted divinity? Brush your teeth afterwards is all I can say. So we've got these two contradictory words in the same sentence, kundalini and Christian, Christian kundalini. So remember from last week, kundalini is, is in Sanskrit, it's simply the word that means coil. There's a coiled bundle of energy right in our uh, uh, pelvic region symbolically, and it rises, and as it rises, we set ourselves up for a kundalini awakening to enter enlightenment, or what we might say in unity, enter Christ consciousness, or, in, or self-realization. A lot of different terms describe the same thing. And the energy, that energy rises and goes through seven energy centers that represent different parts of life, different life issues. And the first chakra, muladhara, in Sanskrit, represents ideas of safety, security, survival. So if you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's what we're talking about. It's all that ground level. Where do we all start and where do we begin? And in our talk last week, we, talked, uh, we made the comparison uh, with Unity's faculty of elimination, or the power of release, we also call it. So that as we grow and mature, then we need to decide for ourselves what part of our origin story, whether the beliefs and attitudes of our family or the communities where we come from, do we choose to keep, which, I, which what truly belongs to me, and what do I need to let go of so that I might be my full individual self? Because all of us come from families and origins and places, and, and sometimes we, we don't really resonate with all of it. And sometimes we do, but we have this capacity to let go of the things that truly don't represent who we are. So that is the root chakra and the faculty of release. And I gave a story, uh, just a reminder, that, that happened when I was in, I remember it was fourth grade. I don't know why I remembered it. Maybe something within me said, you're going to need this in 50 years. 
I wish I could remember where I parked my car. That would be more helpful. Um, so fourth grade, sitting around the lunch table, and we're talking about candidates for county sheriff. And, and <laughs> we're fourth graders. What do we really know about the issues for candidates for county sheriff? We're just parroting what our parents said, not understanding that we eventually would have our own viewpoints and perspectives. So that was an example of something that we decided, I decided, represented that that where we emerge out of that root shock, we just parrot what we know until something comes along and we realize we can know something different. It's kind of like how many people start in one faith community and end up in another one, like this one, because some of the beliefs or teachings of that community, you realize it doesn't work for me anymore. It doesn't make it wrong or bad. It just means I've grown into somebody else, and then we come to unity. It, it, there's a passage in there uh, and some words by Carl Jung that speak to this. He said, to find out what is truly individual in ourselves, profound reflection is needed. And we suddenly realize how uncommonly difficult the discovery of individual individuality is. Anybody who's ever done a really thorough searching and fearless moral inventory knows the difficulty of this work. As if you're really clear and honest with yourself about your character strengths and your defects, it's a lot of work. Where it comes to our character defects, many of us don't want to acknowledge them because we, well, we might be bad people. No, you're just people because we all got them. And then when it comes to really being clear and acknowledging our strengths, many of us are hesitant to do that as well because we've been taught not to do that because that means you're bragging. That means you think you're better than somebody else. Have anybody ever heard words like that? So the great work is to be candid with ourselves and, and real. And it's not always easy. I'll just leave it at that. Not always easy. But I will also tell you, it is always worth the effort. And it is liberating and empowering to be clear about who you are without reservation, without needing anybody else to like your list or not. Because the truth is, as we say in unity, each and every one of us is an individualized expression of everything that God is, being made manifest through the filter of our humanity. So don't get hung up in the filter of your humanity. Do the work. And love the person who's doing the work. So this week, we, we want to look at two things. We want to look at the second chakra, right, sacral chakra. Thank you, uh, Teresa, for bringing us into an awareness of that, also known as Fadhishtana in, in Sanskrit. It rules relationships, how we, how we become an individual person. It rules issues around healthy boundaries. And to learn such things, it's the life-giving and affirmative ways to give and receive nurturance to give and receive emotional and sexual expression, and to, to relate to others. And many of us have issues at some time or another in our lives, probably all of us at some time or another in our lives, when there's energy gets stymied or misdirected or misunderstood or dissipated in some way. Or maybe we find ourselves in a relationship that isn't terribly healthy or appropriate. Uh, maybe nobody in this room, but you probably know somebody who's had that experience. And we wonder why. What happened? A lot of it comes from the fact maybe we didn't learn some of our foundational stuff in the, as we were growing up. And sometimes it's just because life happens and we go unconscious. And we always have a choice when we realize something's gone off the rails or not working out as we had planned it. And the choice is this. What do I make it mean? Do I make it mean that I'll never find love and I'll never have decent friends and I, I always get abused by the people in my life? Or do we lean in with a different question? What's there for me to learn in this situation? Am I really open to learning what I need to learn in this situation? And what am I going to do about it? Now, the doing stuff happens as we begin to honor ourselves and loving ourselves. And we'll say a lot more about doing stuff next week when we look at the third chakra. But we've got to be able to understand 
how valuable and important we all are. We say this all the time in Unity and New Thought, but I don't know that we ever give real clear guidance about how to set up boundaries and how to lovingly um, honor other peoples as well. But that's a lot of what we're talking about in the second chakra. Where how do we connect and relate to others in a healthy and appropriate way? That's why we teach programs on communication, so we really understand what's going on. That's why we set up processes in how we do things here at the church, so we know who needs to be involved in what, at what time. It's a, it's a process, let me tell you. Uh, it's progress, not perfection. Um, so that we always know where we stand and we can move our evolution forward as individuals and in the communities in which we live. It is a tremendous amount of work to really be honest with yourself, and it is an equally amount of tremendous work to develop clear boundaries. It is always worth it. Now, we have more that we'll say about all of this in the class this week, so join us Tuesday night or Thursday morning. There is uh, unity, so that's a little bit, that's kind of like the entree into sacral chakra energy and what that's about. Now, in Unity's teaching of 12 powers, there is another faculty referred to as the faculty of life, located in the same area, lower abdomen, euphemistically explained, um, that represents our capacity to be vibrant. And in the teaching of 12 Powers, as taught by Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore, he corresponded one of Jesus' disciples to each one of the powers. And what's interesting about this one is when Fillmore correlated disciples to the, faculty, to the power of life, he connected Judas. You might think, Judas? Wasn't he the guy who betrayed Jesus, who ended up getting him murdered? Yes, exactly, and that's the point. See, in Fillmore's way of looking at things, it was the, the, he intuited that because this event happened, what are you going to make it mean? We can do that with all of our life experience. Because this event happened, Jesus was able to demonstrate the notion of eternal life, the notion of life beyond life, where it's kind of what we'll be working on with Dr. Moody next week. And if that hadn't happened, if Jesus lived to be 180 years old, oh, so let me tell you about, you know, got to be nice to people. You know, it's a whole, it would have been a different story. But anyway, so the way it is, all of Christianity has this notion put forward of the eternality of life. Now, what's interesting that Charles Fillmore did not know was that in roughly the year 280 of the Common Era, a gospel was written called the Gospel of Judas. And over time, copies vanished and went away, but at least one was saved in, in Egypt in a jar. It surfaced in the 1970s, was fully translated early part of this century. And in the Gospel of Judas, it is a dialogue of conversations between Jesus and Judas, in which Jesus, Jesus says to Judas, you're the only one who really understands me and what I'm doing. I need you to do something for me. Turn me into the Romans. Make this happen. It's like kind of shocking, isn't it? Charles Fillmore didn't know that. However, to use one of Jung's term, in the collective unconscious, that idea must have been abroad. Somehow he intuited it. And then, like I said, the gospel was found. Now, obviously not included in the Bible, uh, Christian or Hebrew, but highlights this notion of what we make something mean. Highlights the idea of synchronicities to seemingly random events that come together in a meaningful way. So Judas is the one who represents life. So both the faculty of life uh, and the sacral chakra inform our capacity to connect, to form relationships, to literally, physically make new life, or to make our lives over in a new way. Many people have had occasion in their lives to have to remake life in a new way, for whatever the reason. But the truth is, and the facts are, that we can do this. We are equipped and empowered to do so. You know, it's, 
you know, I shared, t today's my, my birthday, and I, I shared with Charlotte Shelton and Steve Cumby. We were having uh, dinner one night. Uh, it's right before my 50th birthday. And I said to Charlotte, I said, Charlotte, I'm going to be 50. I can't believe it. A full third of my life is over. <laughs> Very smart woman. She looked at me and goes, Russell, is that an affirmation or a denial? Because I'm not sure I, I know where you're going with this. So I'm not sure either. But so here I am. I'm just going to assume I'll live to be 108. I'm mid midlife. And I'm doing something in the last few years that I think a lot of us do. We get to a point where we have the opportunity to revisit our fundamental truths. What do we know about ourselves? What do we believe about ourselves? How have our thoughts and our actions been in alignment? Where have they not been in alignment? It's a lot of work. And in part of it, it's really rewarding. So I'm like, yay me. And part of it is, what the heck is all that about? But the thing is, for me to have my life go forward, and for all of us to have our lives go forward in meaningful, joy-filled, powerful ways, we must always be willing to do that deep inner look and reflection. What's going on here? Simply as a teacher does a diagnostic test at the beginning of the school year, she needs to know where the kids are about the different subjects so she can direct the lessons accordingly. All of us, I think, are wise to, to really know ourselves and to spend time regularly really asking ourselves, what is this situation? How have I created it? How do I want to live my life going forward? What do I need to do differently? Who do I need to be because that sometimes means that we are creating new life in this form right here and right now. And to realize we are all empowered to do so. Our souls will demand that of us. If we want to get to that exalted stage at the top of the chakra spectrum, at the top of Maslow's pyramid, or at the pinnacle experience that we call Christ consciousness, full realization, self-awareness. It is a tremendous amount of work. And it is amazingly powerful to do, and always worth it. So, from the song To Life, from Fiddler, just a couple lines. lines. Lachayim, lachayim to life. Life has a way of confusing us, blessing and bruising us. So drink, lachayim to life. In other words, everything that happens in your life, give thanks for it. Learn the lessons from it. Share the power that it transforms in you with the world and make the world a better place for all. That's what we've come here to do. Peace be with you and namaste.